All right. Hello, everybody. We're here at Tech Stack Nation. I'm Bonnie. Very excited today to have Jessica Janik from the Angular team in the house tonight. Uh, before we get started really quickly, I want to thank our sponsors, AG Grid, for helping us have this really cool place to come and hang out with the Angular team and other tech experts and chat. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can subscribe to see more or better yet, come and join us because you could be in this call with us live and hang out with uh, with experts like Jessica and ask questions. So yeah, speaking of Jessica, Jessica, how are you? Hello. I'm good. Um, well caffeinated, well hydrated this morning. Um, yeah, good to be here. It's so great to have you back. We love having you visit. We always have fun. You know, we're going to have to ask you about the R2D2 because we love we love the R2D2. Maybe I, I wouldn't say more than Angular, but equally R2D2 is a lot of fun. And it's just so great to have you here. Um, I asked you to come because we wanted to get updates on defer and hydration and just kind of nerd out a little bit and talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we can hear about what you're working on get all the updates. You know, we have to have you here a couple times a year just for the updates because we know you're working on cool stuff. Indeed. Well, um, yeah, uh, a lot of what I'm working on right now is hydration related, but also defer related. They're kind of intertwined. Um, and uh, if anybody has seen like the ng-conf talk that I did um, or the keynote or the Google I.O. talk, there's been a similar demo in all of those talking about partial hydration, which is essentially what my focus is right now, which um, is using defer as kind of a foundational piece um, to be the boundary for where partial hydration will take place. So um, if you're already using defer, um, it'll be pretty uh, straightforward to make that uh, another hydration boundary so that you can leave, not only not worry about those dependencies being uh, part of your initial bundle, but also, um, you know, it, that section of your page won't even be um, hydrated. So uh, it's, it's exciting, it's fun. Um, and I've been doing a lot of work uh, with um, an adjacent team to help get that technology uh, in place. We've talked a bit about in our talks about how uh, Google has another internal, uh, another framework, another web framework that is internal and kind of tied deeply to the Google tech stack. Which is, is that very, Wiz? That's Wiz. We've been um, hearing about that. I have yeah. uh, Jotun on my list. Yeah, he's about uh, he's basically been replay expert. and like that. So that's all tied in with what you're doing. Yes. So okay, but can we back up a little bit first? Yes. Because yes. Um, and by the way, you mentioned this demo that I think would be really cool. I don't know if you have it handy and it's something that you can pull up as we go along, but that would be cool if so. But but I think if we back up a little bit, because here's the question, right? And I and I kind of went through this with Andrew with Zoneless because I see some some topics are super super popular and other topics they're not like not really paying so much attention. So, when we talk about defer, it's basically the same functionality as the lazy loading that we've been using all this time, right? And so I see that a lot of people are just like they've got everything lazy loaded and so I think they're not really paying so much attention to defer. So, can you explain to us like let's go back to the beginning, what was the like what is the problem that you're solving with defer and how what like why did we need to bring that in? And what benefit is that is that giving us or yeah. giving you guys? Because maybe it makes it easier on your end. Like, how is that? How is that different from lazy loading? Well, it, it's not necessarily more like it was a difficult problem to solve. So it certainly wasn't like e e better for us on our end. It was entirely for uh, our user base. Um, but uh, so the lazy loading that we were doing before is mostly on the routes level. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if you wanted to lazy load. Uh, like a, a route, you would go to the router and then you like would, a whole page. Yes. You're essentially yeah. uh, like breaking apart your routes so that your initial bundle doesn't include the routes that aren't um, like all of the code for the routes that aren't loaded yet. So um, for example, uh, a user might not go to their user profile page. So there's no reason to include that in the initial bundle. It makes more sense to lazy load that until it's needed. Right. Um, 
but the the downside is that you're actually um you still need to eagerly include part of your 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 page like you know so or excuse me your routes some of your routes need to be eagerly loaded like your initial uh route of course needs to be eagerly loaded and like uh, a lot of your initial uh more commonly used routes are probably going to be included in that route um that route configuration so that's all going to be eagerly loaded and um for some use cases that's still a pretty significant bundle size initial bundle size especially when like what might be happening on that initial route is that people aren't scrolling down um, or they aren't interacting with certain parts of the page or you've got just some some components on that page are that are heavy but aren't um something that's needing to be interacted with yet maybe it's below the fold you know it could be a couple of uh, different cases here so um people were asking for a way um, and people had come up with workarounds for how they could delay the loading of those components um, but it certainly wasn't easy um, the workaround tools we'd seen were incredibly complex and not fun to work with confusing even for us to look at um, and so we knew this was a desire because people wanted to be able to use similar functionality to what they see in other frameworks like the suspense boundaries that you see in like react and and whatnot um, so we knew this was a need and we wanted to make the best version we could think of for uh this kind of deferred content boundary um, so basically to summarize really quickly we were lazy loading pages and people are asking for it to be able to lazy load part of a page Correct. And have the and this is really where the hydration conversation begins. Yes, exactly. So, um, in this uh, in this new deferable view world, um, which going forward I will call defer blocks because that's how we typically call them internally. Um, we uh, we made it such that inside your template you can specify an area of that uh, template that um, will be um not included in that initial bundle and give you very declarative syntax for how you can specify when uh, or how uh that um set of deferred dependencies will be loaded so you have more granular control over when so for example um let's say it is your initial route um, and it is something that's below the fold and you don't want to have to worry about it until it's actually scrolled into the viewport. You have this on viewport uh, trigger that you can specify for it. And um, as soon as it becomes visible by your user, that's when the lazy loading will occur. And it occurs automatically. You don't have to go in and manually write you know, your dynamic import functionality we manage all of that for you on the framework side. We are doing all of this cool uh, work during the build step that like looks at all of the dependencies and generates that chunk for you. So all of it gets uh, loaded automatically and rendered automatically. Can we stop here for a minute just for fun and talk about what kind of effort behind the curtain went into making that happen? Because the code for us is like, not that much code it's super right. simple right it's just a little defer block and then it go but then making that all happen behind the scenes was did you do a happy dance when you got it working of course we did <laughs> um, so this was done like uh, andrew kushner and i worked together on this and we spent months um like researching and designing this until we had and initially we had talked about doing this as kind of like a higher order component like where we actually um you know you would define uh, a component as a whole that was deferred um and everything underneath it in that um would be deferred but um then like when we discussed it with the team it was pretty clear that like 
it wasn't that wasn't what um was in mind for this that we were looking at something that was sections of a template and that changed how we were uh thinking about it for the better for for a significant a significantly better version and um actually out of this like initially like the control flow um discussion was happening kind of simultaneously and the syntax around control flow the block syntax we were discussing but we weren't really sure how we wanted to make it work and this was kind of a catalyst in making sure control flow happened because we didn't want to design something that had a syntax that immediately would then have to be migrated into another syntax so we um, pushed for control flow to happen at the same time as defer so that we could introduce this new block syntax you know in a more consistent manner um but uh yeah like it took months and behind the scenes we did a lot of like okay uh, we're going to try to make modules and and standalone work and then it became very clear that modules just weren't going to work for this um without a significantly uh larger amount of work um if this is what i love like ever all, there are so many things that you guys have done along the way that allows the next step to happen yeah and some of it we don't even see like the ivy stuff and then there's the template compiler and all these yes. things are going on like we don't even some of us don't even see that but this is all like one step like these things need to happen yeah. in order for the future to go and yeah, so, the, yeah. so there's so there's two challenges that i that i know of right in in things like this um as far as i know you can let me know if I if I'm confused. Um, the the first challenge, of course, being scale, because so many people are mm -hmm. using Angular that whatever you're doing, it needs to be able to scale because we have yeah. some massive Angular applications out there and yeah. lots and lots and lots of things going on on the page. Very complicated, you know, business logic happening at runtime. Uh, and then we have a lot of people using Angular that are using it on smaller applications where mm -hmm. this might not even be a concern. So if you have a smaller Angular app where you don't have a bunch of content below the fold, you might not even need defer, but it, but the people that do care about it have sometimes millions of lines of code, like people inside Google. And then the other thing I think that that I've heard is a, is a challenge is, especially like with the syntax, is you know in higher order functions, there might be more than one way there's more than one possible solution and so if you pick any possible solution you're going to have people coming to say why didn't you do it this way right right so you really want to like take those weigh those conversations and those decisions very very carefully because before you make it official you want to have all those conversations because you guys really put a lot of thought into these things which i love i mean we have to we we, we have such a significant user base like you mentioned and um some of our customers have some pretty um strong use cases and needs that we have to build at scale right away and we can't break anybody so you know we we have to think very heavily about this stuff to make sure we get it right um so a lot of time goes into that design work um and a lot of eyes are on that design work before it even is seen by uh, external users. So um, we get a ton of feedback on stuff and we sometimes work with internal partners early. Um, we uh, like test things out, we benchmark things sometimes. Um, it, it depends on what we're working on, but um, yeah so there, there's a there's definitely the scale issue but i think beyond just the scale issue like we heavily think about like we are very developer experience focused and um it if there's one thing i've learned in my entire developer engine like engineering career over the, the past um redacted amount of time um, <laughs> is that most developers are terrible uh, UX designers. Um, most don't think about it. And um, that goes also for developer experience because we are too close to what we're working on. And 
Um, I certainly have written things where I'm just like, oh yeah, this makes perfect sense. And then you show it to someone and they're like, what is this? Um, or it gets slower and slower the more code you add and you don't notice it because you've been working on the right. same project so long. Yeah, so so like it, it really, um, you have to stop and go like, okay, this makes sense to me, but would I wanna use this if it was not something I wrote? Right. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to do. So, um, like, we have to think about that. And, and I think we do a really good job of it, like, in the last, especially in the last, like, several years. Like, this has been our focus. We we stop, we think. We also ask a lot of good questions. We get a lot of good feedback ahead of time. And, and we want to make sure that our developer experience is top-notch. And I'd like to think that like defer is a prime example of that, especially um, like we've gone on non angular, uh, you know, YouTube channels and stuff like learning with Jason, for example. Um, and he tried out defer uh, for the first time. He's like, this is awesome. Like he like he's not an angular developer and he thought it was exceptional. So um, like that's the kind of experience we're aiming for. We want to make sure that people are looking at our new APIs and they're looking at Angular and they're going, you know, this isn't confusing. This actually is really quick and easy to understand and that this is something that's approachable that I would like to work with. That's yeah. that's our goal. And I think it's so because I deal with so many uh developers out there in the world, right? Uh and and you know we talked earlier about uh, i was saying you know signals is like super sexy everybody loves it it's very popular everybody's using it because state management is something that i think all of us are dealing with like how do we get it from the http client to the actual view right um but we don't hear as much yet about defer because everybody's still got their pages lazy loaded and i think and i don't want to like give people bad habits right I don't want you guys to go out and use defer because it's the cool latest thing. Because if you have a smaller application, you might not need it. So don't run out and update all your lazy loaded stuff to defer. If you have small pages and you don't have anything below the fold, that's not necessary. You don't need to do that. We just want you to know about it because there are, and, and like I said earlier, I love Jessica. I think last time you were here, you were talking about some of the conversations that you guys were having with other teams like uh, Ryan Carniato, we met uh, last mm -hmm. week. He's so cool. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, talking to the view people about this. And, and, and I've even seen like Evan, you is talking about the fine grain hydration. So even if you are working on a smaller angular project, um, I think that this conversation is so interesting because it's not just angular. Like this is like, this is like the future happening, you know, because it's, because this, question of fine grain hydration you guys are basically all kind of just having this conversation going forward together because we're doing things now that that weren't possible before that's so cool yes and in in doing all the research about partial or progressive hydration what we've one of the biggest strongest things we've learned is that no one agrees on what that means. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've had multiple uh, sources of truth for what those terms mean. And we're like, do we come up with our own term? Uh, like, like our when we look at what we think partial hydration is, but we, we look at what we think React views partial hydration is, like they're conflicting. Um, so it's, it's a moving target and that's that's a challenge um but uh we're just going to keep pushing forward with what we think makes the most sense and um so yeah. let's talk about what partial so, so let me see if i can try to define it and then you can fill me in on how it's not so simple right because like we were saying with lazy loading pages and then we're so it's like lazy loading a page versus lazy loading a component and 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 then we bring ssr into the conversation because SSR, ideally, from the beginning, what the way that it was explained to me is SSR works or was designed really works best with maybe large static pages. Like if you have like a Wikipedia thing, you got a bunch of static content, 
that's the perfect ideal candidate or perfect use case for SSR. When you got a bunch of stuff on your page, you want to render it because it's not really changing that much, right? Then I, when you have your, you want to, you want to use the benefits of SSR, but you don't necessarily have a static page. You have dynamic things that need to be updated on your page. And so that's really where we come to like, we don't want to update the whole entire page, re-render the whole entire page. We only want to re-render the thing that changed, right? Well, sort of. So the first case you're talking about, like the Wikipedia case, I think would be mm -hmm. a good use case for um, not necessarily SSR, but like pre-rendered um, pre content. Mm -hmm. So um, like you can do uh, that sort of uh, static site generation um, as a form of, um, we, we, we can do that with, with uh, you know, our server-side rendering uh, stuff, but that's not exactly server-side rendering. So, But uh, the pre-rendering is pretty easy when all the content is static. Right. 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 So, so that that's why I think that's a good case for for like a Wikipedia site because that content isn't changing that much. Right. Um, like the hybrid rendering concept is something that is moving uh, forward in the industry pretty quickly as well, which is a mixture of pre-rendered content and server rendered content, all kind of and client rendered content, all in the same mm -hmm. application. Um, really what it comes down to is what your goals are, what your, what your needs are. So for, um, for an application that, um, is dynamic and, um, has, uh, needs for core web vitals and you're very concerned about that initial render experience, server-side rendering is hugely valuable. Um, if you don't have the need for dynamic um content um on your your initial render then you know static site generation is and pre-rendered content is probably a good option for you um and if you've got a mixture of all of those things hybrid rendering is the way to go um but yeah primarily people are using server-side rendering for um trying to get that initial render speed um, like the perceived initial render speed super, super fast so that they can improve their core web vitals so that they can have a better user experience, have better, uh, you know, performance in the search engines. And, um, yeah, so that's a big factor for people wanting to do server-side rendering. And, um, th along with that comes that desire to have a faster, um, initial load and a smaller initial bundle because the smaller your bundle size is going to be, the faster it's going to get to your clients, um, especially in cases with um, like lower internet speed in like developing countries that don't have 5G, you know, and, and fast uh, devices. So, you know, the people who are running international e-commerce sites, for example, probably care about that quite a bit. So um, that's, I think that's the difference there um, and what what the, the purpose is around server-side running. But we're also seeing kind of a push towards this kind of hybrid approach universally, I guess. Um, and um, that's why a lot of meta frameworks have popped up and that's why server-side rendering has just become more of a thing amongst all of the front-end frameworks. I've heard of people talking about how this pendulum has started to like swing back and forth where like it used to be where we were doing all, you know, server rendered apps and um, like, you look at like the Ruby on Rails experience and stuff that that was the thing like we, 10 years ago. And then we were starting to inject uh, these like JavaScript frame frameworks like, excuse me, Knockout was uh, an early one that was like a precursor to AngularJS um, that was kind of injecting all of this kind of reactivity into people's uh, applications. And then we started moving uh, the other way with like AngularJS and um, the early React and 
uh, Backbone and all of those early frameworks. And now we're kind of swinging back uh, where everything was client rendered with all of those frameworks. And now we're coming back to this kind of server focus. So but we didn't have this interactive functionality before. Right. So and now we're bringing that with us as we swing back and say, yes, but we also want everything to be dynamic, which right. is so cool. I've, I've heard criticism from some folks about how, you know, well, I don't like, like the modern front end experience because, you know, now we're just swinging back to the server rendered. Well, why do we, why are we doing things this way? And um, where people don't see the value of it. And th there is a, in like, from, from my perspective, there is a huge difference between what we did before and what we do now, because um, what we did before is we had to write in multiple languages and we still were shipping a whole bunch of JavaScript that wasn't optimized. And each individual multi-page load involved fetching and a delay of interactivity. And waiting we, for the page to reload on every waiting, single thing that you yeah. did. Uh, yeah, so now you're writing everything pretty much in one language and you kind of get the benefits of both. So um, I personally much prefer the modern experience over what we had before. Um, I think what we had before was harder to deal with type safety. It was harder to have to manage completely different backend language and front end language and very error prone in that regard. Um, and now it's kind of all integrated into one. The challenges we're going to see now is like JavaScript as a, a backend is not the best um, kind of performing uh, at scale. So uh, oh, I think we're going to see some more innovations in, in that space over time. Um, yeah. One of the things that I've heard lately, especially since 17 and 18 came out, is I've heard some people saying, Angular's changing so many things. There's so much going on. It's hard to keep up with everything. And I get that. Um, I get how people could feel that way. And, you know, it might be feel a little overwhelming. But for me, you guys have been coming and visiting us in this group a couple times, like once or twice a month for the last few years. And so we've talked so much about this you know, and talking about like what you guys are going to be working on next and keep an eye on this space because there's going to be more innovation. This is what we, you know, discussions that we're having. So for me, it doesn't feel like anything's coming out of left field at all because we've, I mean, we've been talking about zoneless for five years. We've been, you know, more and more talking about hydration. And like I said, it's not changes coming from the Angular team. Like this is conversations that, that all of the teams are having with Svelte mm -hmm. and Solid mm -hmm. and everything. So I think this is fascinating. Um, so yeah. Here then, in this group, like it, it's, it's, I, I, I don't think it's confusing at all. I think it's really exciting because I feel like it's this whole evolution that we get to be a part of. Yeah, and and like that said, like this is a group that's very engaged um, and are paying attention. I think the average developer is probably not paying attention, and um, like they are seeing this change super fast for them. Um, and I, I do sympathize because a lot is changing fast. Um, uh, maybe it's for me, and, and you know, this, can I just say this for a minute? Because this really goes back to yeah. why I started this. <laughs> okay, never mind. Uh, this really goes back to why I started this group in the beginning. Because for me, and, and even like right here, right now, right? It, it is so helpful for me to actually sit down face to face and say, okay, Jess, explain this to me. Let's talk more about this because I know this, I hear this, but you know, why do we need this? What made you decide to build this? What problem is this solving? And for me to be able to actually sit and talk to you about that and say, let's discuss, let's nerd out about this. And then once you're gone, like I really feel much more confident about why you did that and why it benefits us and how, why we should be using this. And like I said, even about the perf you don't need to go and update all your stuff to use defer. If you, if you have a very small app, you, you might never need it, but it's cool for you to know that it's there because when you do yep. get to the point where you need it, if you accident, if you don't know about it, you're just going to write a lot more code, then this is going to just handle all that for you. And it's going to be really streamlined and beautiful. Uh, so yeah. So little shout out to come and join our group. If you find any <laughs> of this intimidating, 
if you come and hang out with us every week, then uh, you will no longer be intimidated because we know what's coming up ahead next. Uh, and and also like as your app grows more and more, and if you care about about hydration, uh, then number one, you need to be keeping an eye on Jessica and, and and Andrew and what they're working on. And also, if you do care about hydration, fine grain hydration, as this is going on more and more. Um, then you should probably be going ahead and using defer because if you're using defer, it's going to make it easier for you to go along and follow along with the Angular team. Yeah. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about this kind of partial hydration approach that we're taking and why. Um, so um, one of the challenges with um, like defer is great. Um, and if you're you like, you want that, uh, bundle size uh, decreased, and you're you're um, uh, you know doing client side rendering. You can use it as is. However, if you're using server side rendering, and your big goal is core web vitals, and you've got hydration enabled, what ends up happening when you use defer is you get your placeholder loaded, and the placeholder hydrates. And can you tell us a little bit about core web vitals for the people that haven't heard that sure. term before? So Core Web Vitals is something that is used uh, to, it's essentially a set of metrics um, that you can measure using, uh, like the Lighthouse extension is an example. And that will tell you um, how your page is performing um, across various specific metrics, like uh, time to first paint and, um, uh, like INP, what does that stand for? Uh, interaction to, I can't remember. I'm so I bad with you. But basically, Core um, Web Vitals is performance, basically. Yeah, if you it's care a performance how fast measure. your page loads, that's Core yeah. Web Vitals. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, and I did not uh, know that, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> I knew performance, but I didn't know. See? We yeah. learned. Okay. And and it it's it's helpful because it will tell you areas for improvement for your application on the performance uh, side. So you'll you'll get a set of metrics you can look at and say like why is this one low? It will tell you. Uh, in some cases, it's bundle size related. In some cases, it's something is blocking. Something is taking too long to load. Maybe you aren't using a CDN. Maybe um, you know there's a there's a bunch of reasons why you know you might be running into problems. And so we. We've been trying to create ways for you to solve these. So, like the the new image directive, the optimized image directive is a prime example of that. I um, love it. So um, that exists now because your um, your your big main content feature uh, item on your page uh, might be a big image, right? And um, you may be sending that image down to your client in the least optimized manner. It could be the biggest quality possible because that's all you have. And the optimized image directive allows you to essentially um, use uh, a specific CDN um, and image optimization feature that will actually generate the right size needed for your, your, your client at at the at the render at the situation where it's rendering it knows how big it needs to be it will actually serve the right size so you don't have to manage that you don't have to go in and be like oh i need to generate all these different sizes and stuff um, and that will actually uh, increase your core web vital performance for your um for one of those metrics defer will help with like uh, that blocking JavaScript at at the uh, initial load because your initial bundle size is smaller, so it takes less time to bootstrap um, and fetch, and so you'll get uh, a higher score there. But one of the metrics that you may encounter is um, something called CLS, um, cumulative layout shift, and what that metric means is. Um, as your page is loading, things are shifting around because some things take longer to load. Um, so, for example, I think sometimes they do that on purpose to make us click on the ads. I would agree. Yeah. I think there are some bad actors out there that do that on purpose. Yes. Yeah. So, like, this would be like something where, like, let's say an image is huge, 
um, or a component is is taking a long time to fetch something and the, the initial load is rendering, but that area is blank. And, and then suddenly it, your whole page shifts, the layout shifts because now that like that image file has fetched and starts rendering. Um, that is a layout shift. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're using defer and you're using a placeholder um, on a server side render, you might see if it's above the fold content, you might see a layout shift because um, what's happening is that placeholder might be different um, than what your actual content is going to end up being. So um, in order to solve for this, uh, our partial hydration approach is essentially allowing you to configure your um, defer block to essentially render through on the server, but not on the client. Uh, like So essentially what I mean by that is when you define a defer block, you say, here's my uh, content that I want deferred inside that. That is your main template. So all of those components and whatever that are in, in that uh, part of your uh, defer block, that will all be defer loaded till later. So you specify your trigger and whatnot. And then you have a placeholder block that specifies what renders during that uh, or before that content has been fetched. Uh, with our approach to partial hydration, essentially on the server side where you have significantly higher resources, network throughput, um, everything's much faster rather than deferring that content. We actually just like fetch and render it on the server so that essentially you don't need a placeholder. Your deferred content is your placeholder that gets sent to the client, but on the client side, it's still deferred. So the dependencies haven't been fetched, but you can see the content that will be there or would have been there after the defer had been triggered. Nice. So and you don't have any content shift. You would have no content shift because all that content already exists. So, um, and and this is interesting because you wrote this functionality into the defer. So we get this functionality without any extra code. Well, there will be a little extra because um, well, you'll you'll need to be able to specify that this is the behavior you want. Mm -hmm. So um, we're looking is this, at is this now or this is what you're still working on. This is what we're still working on. Okay. Okay. I was going to say, show us Jess, but it's not ready yet. Right. And the, the prototype uh, that, that we showed in the demo and stuff, that's, that's real and doing this behavior, um, but it's fairly limited right now. And it's not um, in the form that we want to actually ship out. And there's probably going to be an RFC around this. But I love um, that you're working on this. I think this is great. Keep going. Yeah. Yes. yes. So, uh, so. Good work. What's cool mm -hmm. is that in this case, rather than like just um, dealing with mm -hmm. ren like it, like with a defer block, you normally have rendering and fetching. Um, uh -huh. like so it fetches and then renders. But with this new kind of progressive or partial hydration approach, it's it's actually not really dealing with rendering. It's dealing with hydrating. So it still fetches those dependencies, but then it just triggers the hydration afterwards. And then along with that. Um, this is where the Wiz framework comes into play because we've talked a bit um, in our keynotes about how, like, we're we're kind of partnered with them and we're sharing code with them. Um, and this involved us putting pulling in uh, into our framework uh, repository now something called JS Action. And JS Action was a and is a library that was developed for Wiz that is entirely designed around being able to handle and re it is an event replay system. So oh yes, I heard about this from Mark last week. Yes, Love that. it's super cool. Tell, so, okay, yeah, tell us this. Tell us the what what does the event replay do? So um, right now, if you're using full app hydration. Um, actually now this actually shipped out with v18 um prior to v18 if you had full app hydration on and uh let's say someone interacts with your app um like on something that has an event handler like a button or whatever 
um, before that hydration completes, um, that event would have been dropped. So, so if they're clicking on your page and it hasn't finished loading yet, there's no way for you to know that. Right. So yeah, like user has loaded up your page and um, they're on a slower connection potentially, or or your app is just big and it's still bootstrapping. And they're like, well, I want to click on buy now. I want to click on my profile or whatever. Um, before the app is bootstrapped, that is essentially just dropped information, completely ignored. So we've now integrated this JS Action Library in with full application hydration, such that um, it won't be dropped anymore. Essentially, at the start of the app, there's an inline script that uh, essentially creates a very, very small um, global event handler for all the events that will potentially occur on your page. And um, this is with server-side rendering specifically. And so it looks at all of those um, events and throughout your whole page, it captures every everything you do related to those events. So um, like if you click on a button, it queues that up. It essentially says, hey, here's the event that was uh, queued, store this, and then after hydration finishes, replay it. So uh, essentially, you know, once hydration finishes, then that button click essentially gets replayed and the interaction is captured. So um, that user's interaction isn't dropped anymore. It's just uh, delayed a couple of like maybe a half second until um, the app is ready. And then um, that user, whatever their, their action was, gets, gets uh, replayed. And that's awesome. We're thrilled that we have this now. Um, and it's uh, just like signals. It's something that we're actually sharing the implementation with with Wiz. So, um, and it's open source now. People can go take a look at it. It's it's in our repository, um, and you can see how it works if you want to. Um, it's very cool, and the people who are working on it are very smart. Um, and we're going to invite them to come and hang out. We're actually relying on that exact. Um, event replay functionality to make sh sure that in our partial hydration approach, um, we're also capturing and replaying those exact things in dehydrated content within um, a, a partially hydrated. So if you've got a block of code that's like you, you're using our partial hydration functionality and there's a button in there and someone clicks on it, but it's not hydrated yet because you've got hydration and interaction or something like that, um we don't want people to be like click 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 nothing's happening um so uh we're actually also using that as a signal to hydrate so um if someone clicks on it we forcefully hydrate regardless of your condition of what you want that hydration to be and we queue that event up and replay it again so we view this as so if they click on something that's got to defer and it's not hydrated then and that's and that's why you wanted the event event replay because you want to just assume like okay they're clicking on that let's go ahead and give it give give it to them and so, respond to the click also yes. not just display it but respond to the th to the click yes. that came in before the component was loaded yeah nice exactly that that was a thing that was a barrier to us wanting to do this because we we could have considered this option for defer as a partial hydration boundary before but we did not like the idea of dropping these events. We did not think that was the best user experience. So we wanted to make sure we had something in place to make this the most ideal um, user experience for people. Um, and that's very cool. I mean, I don't know, cause you've been working on it a long time. I don't know if you said like for, for me, that's very cool because yeah, it's just, that's the reason why is it, it, it really takes me back to the, very beginning of angular js with the two-way data binding like that wasn't possible with jquery you couldn't just do it and like mm -hmm. it was i mean you could do it with jquery but it was way more code it was a lot and of manual so writing this whole yeah so this whole thing with the event replay like this fun i was i was thinking and you kept on talking and you answered my question which was so fun um like where did this idea come from because 
everyone accepted a long time ago that when you're clicking on the page that hasn't loaded yet, like you're, you, there's nothing you can do about that because you just can't, that's not functionality that exists. And yet someone somewhere decided it should. And this is why I think it's so cool to uh, keep up with the latest of what's going on, not just with Angular, but with all of the other frameworks as well, collaborating and like breaking the sound barrier, you know, well, not the sound what, barrier, but like the tech barrier. What's funny about that being considered latest technology, it's not, it's been around for 10 years internally. Um, like this has been part of the Wiz framework from the get-go. So mm -hmm. really like the Wiz framework was kind of trailblazing a long time ago with this technology. Um, and funnily enough, it was open sourced and then it was kind of abandoned and now we've re-open sourced it. Um, because so, I don't think that this was functionality that a lot of people were looking for. Well, on a page right. level, right, right? That we're just used to clicking on things and then it's going to happen when it happens. But then on the hydration level, when we're talking about really, you know, breaking down these pages into separate components and, and exactly like you said, when you want to click on that, somebody clicks on it and it's not there yet that you want to be able to offer them that, like, that's so cool what's what's even you know more cool is to know that this exact library is powering some of the largest applications that you interact with that are google you know google technology like search and photos and you know all of those sites that these big big sites that were built with wiz are all using the same technology it's a big reason why um those experiences are so fast because Wiz was built around um, performance first above everything else. Um, and um, that's that's what this is the kind of thing that happens when you when you build a framework around that. You you have tools like JS Action that, that come into being. So love it. We're gonna get them. We're gonna go, we're gonna go ask them to come and hang out with us and nerd out about Wiz and just hear more about it because I think it's like for us outside of Google. It's like, what is this Wiz thing? We're not, right. we haven't been hearing about this until they merge with Angular. And then it's like, what, wait, what's going yeah. on? Yeah, we know uh, that was like, when that was announced, like tweeted by by uh, Sarah, we were all not prepared <laughs> for it. And then we saw it, we're like, oh, oh no, we're getting a whole bunch of, uh, you know, <laughs> a whole bunch of people are like, what is going on? Is Angular dead or whatever? It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, I normally really 100% support and uh, love the decisions that you guys make. But even I was that I was like, what? I was suspicious, but I'm coming around. I'm coming around. And so, and I talked to Mark about this event replay last week and it was pretty exciting. And so I'm seeing more and more that this is something that we should be paying attention to, which is why I love for you to come and hang out with us and sit down and explain these things to us. Because sometimes we see these things on a really quick, you know, YouTube channel, we see like mm -hmm. the announcements, we see the blog posts, but it's really, I think it's so cool for you to actually sit and unpack it with us so that we can you know, because we're because when we're outside of Google, it all comes so fast and, it, and we don't really necessarily see all of it that you just see. So that's really cool. I want to pause for a minute and see if anyone else in the call has any questions. We've got a couple other people in the call with us. Any questions, comments? Um, and if not, I think uh, we can wrap this up. I want to see, uh, Jessica, if you have any more thoughts for us about this, because, you know, we want to see R2D2. Of, of course. Uh, I, I guess um, we don't have any we don't have any comments or questions in the call, but do you have any more thoughts? Yeah, about this just, topic. Just briefly, I'll say that like I know when that was tweeted about uh, with Wiz and Angular merging, mm -hmm. um, there was really no context provided, so I know it was confusing for people. But just know that this isn't something that we're doing in terms of like, oh, Angular is going to go away or whatever. It's more that we are trying to share code and make the experience for Angular and Wiz like excellent. And that um, all this means is the experience is going to continue to get better. That Angular isn't going anywhere. We're still here. Um, that we're just getting the best of of, of both of these frameworks um, together, and 
it's not on like a you know six months time frame this is uh, going to take a while and um you will still be brought along along the way this isn't <laughs> isn't going to like change anything other than make things uh just continually better experience i love it and you know my favorite question is always like if we go back to the beginning like what problem are we solving right and so if we talk about like why are we bringing in whiz then if we look at this event replay like this is right this is exactly this is functionality that that whiz already had and then mm -hmm. you would have to go and write all that code again or yeah. you can just borrow it from them which makes yes. everything nice and streamlined like uh really what it comes down to is you know we were duplicating a lot of efforts and um each of our frameworks does certain things exceptionally and certain things as like have areas where um you know needs improvement and the uh signal situation is one where we're angular uh we had already put together a fantastic library and wiz was like we need something like this so they were able to reuse our work and we needed uh, this event replay functionality, so we were able to borrow from them. And this kind of, um, God, I hate this term, but synergy um, <laughs> will continue, will continue um, as we uh, you know, evolve both of these frameworks. Um, and you're only gonna see the best of it. Like, you know, th th there's a, a lot of good work as we think through evolving our framework we're also thinking in terms of like how will this also um be usable for for folks in whiz and what can we do there so yeah it's only going to be it's only going to be awesome stuff love it i uh you're you're just gonna have to come back a couple times a year and just keep us updated because i feel like you guys are just barely getting started with the whole angular whiz collaboration and mm -hmm. other collaborations with other and then the whole fine grain hydration like there's so much more to this uh but yeah so this i think is really just to wrap everything up you do not need to run out and update all your stuff to use defer you don't need to use defer but if you have a lot of stuff going on on your page and you want that fine grain hydration then absolutely that, that's what defer is for and it's continuing to even just have more polish as you break the tech barriers and if you do use defer you'll probably love it yeah yeah it's so easy it's so easy and we didn't do we, so we didn't do the demo today but that's okay because this demo is going to appear on youtube already in several places yeah. so yeah it's already see, it's on, it's in the angular.dev there there are so many um examples of the defer and it's just a little bit of code so it's really not even complicated um, there are so many examples of that stack blitz is out there um so that should be easy for you to find but this just just talking through this was really i think it was really cool i don't know if it was cool for anybody else but it was cool for me thank you so much speaking of cool okay jess you know what's next right you know we're, we're <laughs> yes. always going to talk to you and this is one of the reasons why i'm like okay we got to wrap this up because we want to we want to see what's up with r2d2 we love your r2d2 i don't know why that's so cool but and well i do because it's r2d2 yeah uh, can, so, you, can you update us what's the scoop R2, you moved r2d2 to boston how did that go can we talk about that because it's like very very heavy yeah he's 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 pretty heavy um he's like near 100 pounds and i had to get uh, a shipping crate and pack him up in the shipping crate safely i took his head off and shipped that separately in a well-packed uh double walled cardboard box so that survived the trip is fine. No um, damage? No, uh, no damage to the dome. There was a little bit of paint damage to one of his shoulders. And um, that only intended. happened That only happened because of the strap that I had. It was too close to his shoulder and I didn't have a good enough padding in there, but that's easily repairable. And plus with R2, like the more he gets dinged up, the more like, like yeah that's, world that's he feels. real yeah so authenticity Jeff. yes yes i personally prefer the factory fresh look but a lot of people weather their uh their droids yeah. um 
So, uh, but he's he's still doing great. He's still uh, as functional as he was before. The new things that I'm working on right now, um, this is one bit. So this is, uh, if you- Can you pull it closer? Yes. So um, you might recognize this as the little arm that pops out and then like pops forward yeah. and starts, you know, yeah. twisting around and reading data ports. So this is gonna go on one of his front panels, but I only recently got him uh, this this new part. Um, and those front panels, um, I'm also working with these. These are hinges and you can see the weird uh, like elbow angle here. Um, yeah. So it's gotta be round and hingy at the same time. Well, it, it's more that like, the body um, mm -hmm. actually has to like, so when this opens, it spins like, like this. Mm -hmm. And you can see how it has to make room for um, the body here. So, cause the body will actually, it rotates um, like there's a body panel here and it has to rotate and clear that front body. So, okay, I have a question. Where do you get these parts? Do you have them made custom or is there like a club for R2D2 builders or like what, where do they come from? Uh, there is a club. Yes. <laughs> there is a club. And in that club, there are people who actually have designed out some of these parts. There's multiple iterations of them and um, they'll um, either hire out um, metal shops to fabricate them or they will do it in their own in environment. But that's how I've got it. There's a Texas based um, shop that makes these. I don't know where this guy's based, but um, these are just, just so specific simple aluminum. Yeah. Um, otherwise, like some a lot of the stuff is standard, like this is just a standard threaded rod with some some like, you know, washers and nuts at the end. So but um, I also have a few other components here. So um, I thought I'd show off. So this is the life form scanner that spins around. It's the little- uh, The thing that comes up out of the top of his head? Yeah, from Return of the Jedi. And there's, there's more pieces to it, but um, like, little cylinders and stuff that eventually will go underneath and there's a little like a blinky light so this will actually pop out of the dome and spin at some point we're gonna have to see that when you get it working um, I, I, we need like an rss feed so we can subscribe for updates and can, <laughs> yeah i've also got this this box here which i haven't opened in a while but um this is a fairly detailed part that you might recognize. Um, Hold it closer. Oops, hang on one second. Oh no, don't break it. No, it's just a loose part. There we go. So, um, there. This is the periscope that also pops out of the, the dome there's a light set that goes in here and it also turns around. So, wow. Um, and and this they're all gonna work? Yes. Well, work is a uh, loose I mean, term. they're gonna, they, they, will, they pop they in and out. Around. <laughs> um, but this actually won't have like a camera that can see out because yeah. it doesn't really make sense. There's it not fun. actually a little robot in there. It's right. It's just a replica but it's so cool. And then additionally, um, I have these, which is for a different droid. So- There's the another droid, is it C-3PO? What's, what, a different droid? Yes, so this, these are the eyes for an R5, which is the red droid that has a different shaped head. Um, uh, hold on, this is brand new to me. This is coming out of left field, Jess. Hold on, slow down. What would I haven't even there's another I think you mentioned this briefly. There are there are many droids in Star Wars. <laughs> so wait, but so you're building another droid. There will be many. There will be many. I I have um so there's this guy right here, right? 
this is a Lego set for BD1. You know, it's too far from the camera, or I'm too nearsighted, or my I, I need to make my screen bigger. Hold here, on, here's, a, here's what we'll do. Uh, yeah, I will. I will just um, zoom. Oh, cool. So we'll we'll see if this will zoom in enough. So this guy. Yeah, I see him now. He's a little two-legged guy. Um, his name is BD1. He's from a video game, but also appeared in the Boba Fett series. And um, I actually have printed all of the components to make uh, uh, an animatronic version of, like an actual size version of that droid. But I just haven't finished it yet. I've got a lot of work to do on it. Um, You're the coolest nerd in the planet, I think. That's, and then, so, that's so fun. As of this week, I actually just got a fancy brand new 3D printer that I need to assemble that is big enough that I can actually start printing. Um, like I could print a, a dome all in one go. Um, so I'm going to start building Chopper, who is one of my favorite uh, droids. So are you posting updates anywhere on social media or online i know you have a blog but i don't i don't know if you ever put r2d2 i think you should or you just need to come more often i think maybe we need to have like a special session for just the droids i um i am usually very bad about posting updates but um because I usually get focused on my work and then suddenly it's like two days later. Um, this is why you need Bonnie to come along a couple times a year and say, just catch us up. Tell us what's going on. Well, uh, I can I can uh, make them the note that if anybody is in the Boston area, uh, the weekend of the, I think it's the 14th of June to so two weeks from now, R2 will be making an appearance at Fan Expo Boston. So um, if you would uh, like to, to meet my specific droid, you will be able to do that there. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to make it because it's pretty far away, but maybe you could get some videos while you've got him out running around. Sure. We would love um, that. Cause you know, we love R2D2 and also the other, I just think this is so much fun. So yeah, we, we love your updates all the time. Yeah, and, uh, and other fandoms. Um, I actually got to go tour the um, USS Enterprise bridge and set recently as well. So fun. that was pretty fun. That is so cool. So cool. You're always up to cool stuff. Okay. Uh, does anyone have questions for the R2-D2 uh, droid section of this discussion? Going once, going twice. Okay, I know we can't keep Jess all day, so I don't want to push my luck, but Jess, do you have time to stay for our Stack Blitz fun? Sure. Okay, uh, Andy's already seen this because Andy was with me earlier when I was writing this, but I just want to show this to everybody because Connie, especially, Connie, are you awake? Are you with us, Connie? Yes, I'm still alive. <laughs> okay, this, I don't know if I said this out loud yesterday, but when we were talking, we were having this whole conversation about using signals for state management and how to get it from the HTTP client, which is an observable to the signal and how to do that and whether or not you need a, a state management library or like, because there seems to be some like how, so I wanted to, I, I just wanted to play with it and see, it took me a while because I had all kinds of weird stuff that I was doing, but Andy was helping. We pair programmed on this and I want to share my screen and show you what I came up with. Jessica, I want you to just basically tell me if there's a better way to do this or look over everything. But I think this is going to be pretty simple and uh, we will walk through it together and it'll be fun. Okay, let's start here. Um, we've got this, we've got, well, let me start here. Let me start with the with the dummy data. Um, it's just to-dos, right? It's We've got completed ID title, this is it. And this is our this is our placeholder data. Um, this is our interface, right? Simple stuff. That's a whole file. This is just we're so what we're going to do is we're going to start with this placeholder data. And then what we want to do is we want to go and get an HTTP client request, right? And then we want to update it. So I have two, uh, we've got a writable signal. We've got the HTTP. I don't need that extra space there. Okay. Uh, 
this is what we're going to access outside. The data signal is what we're going to access outside when we go to our component in a minute. But the first one is the normal one, just the HTTP GET. We're going to subscribe, and then we're going to update our signal here. And that's all the code that you need. This was what I actually had started with because I, what I wanted to see was I wanted to see the delay that we're going to have. Um, why is it? Oh, because it's still building. I wanted to make a delay to show this uh, when the data comes in, it's going to have a delay. But why is it not updating now? Mm -hmm. It worked earlier. Let me see. I'm popping this out so that I can see the console log and see if there's any uh, errors here. New collection symbol, it what? OK, something's broken. That's OK. That's OK. Share this tab. No, that's not the right one. It's this one. Um. OK, well, maybe we should turn off the recording and do this offline because I can't live code and fix it and troubleshoot at the same time while the recording's on my my. Uh, but basically, it was working a little while ago. But this is really let me go really quick before I turn off the recording um, to the. Uh, Index. No, not index. It was the main here. To see what we're going to do is just uh, load that and then have it here. This is our this is our signal here. So, and the point is, I wanted to show you guys. Oh, this is what messed us up though, because I didn't have that, so that was really slowing us down. Anyway, I wanted to show you guys this because this is not a lot of code. So it's beautiful. But anyway, I'm going to I'm going to turn off the recording and see if I can figure out why this is not working and then we'll get more into that later. Okay, before I turn off the recording, uh you guys know the drill. Can you please come off mute and help me thank Jessica for making time to hang out with us today? Thanks, Jess. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Jessica. I love all to do too. Yes, we do love R2D2. And just please, if you have time, stay. Uh, we're going to hang out for a bit after we turn off the recording and we'll play with this stack list a little more. <laughs> 